Is it because God is sick? Is it because God doesn't love us? Is it because God lost his power? It is because we are not committed to get together and pray for the promised power. After I finished school in Andrews, I was called in a district in the north. And uh, I went to church. It was way north, one state that is close to Canada. And it was winter, it was January. <clears throat> and I went to church and there were about 20 people in the church. All of them between 76 and 92 years old. 20 people, you know, all of them. And I respect elderly, but you also need to have some youth. Because if you have only elderly, very soon you don't have anybody. <clears throat> So I said to my wife, what am I doing in this church? Because tomorrow we have a funeral and then we have no church. And then I went to church next Sabbath. It was minus 36 Fahrenheit. Minus 36 cold. You probably don't even know what that means, minus 36. I remember one time in Norway, it was minus 50. 56 Celsius, minus 56. It was so cold that you would boil water, boiling water, throw it, and before it reaches the ground, it was ice. <clears throat> so I got to church, and in that Sabbath, there were nine people in the church. My family, four, and another five. I said to them, it's only five ladies, should I preach? And the head elder, who was a lady that was 92 years old, she said, Pastor, we pay tight, so you better preach. <laughs> I gave the sermon to five ladies, and I went home depressed. I said to my wife, we need to move. Go to a nice big church where you have 300, 500 people, not five ladies. And my wife says, no, we don't need to move. You need to get out of ministry. I said, why do I need to get out of ministry? And she said, because you have a lot of preaching and theory, but you don't live what you preach. I said, what do you mean? And she said, you preach today that Jesus said, wherever two or three, Jesus didn't say 200 or 300. Jesus said how many? Two or three. That's less than five. Wherever two or three come together, I am in their midst. And then the next Bible verse, because wherever two or three Pray in one accord. That doesn't mean that they are together in a Honda accord. To pray in one accord means in translation that they pray in unity of purpose. The book of Acts of the Apostles says that the disciples, when they pray together in the upper room, they all had needs. They were sick, they were poor, they were persecuted, they had needs. But she says, they didn't pray for a blessing for themselves. They didn't ask for help for themselves. She says, they forgot themselves, sacrificed themselves, and they united and all prayed together for one, only one purpose. In one accord, in unity, they united and prayed for one purpose, for the outpouring of the promised comforter. So back to what Jesus said. Jesus said, for whenever two or three pray in one accord, that means two or three of you get together and pray in unity for one purpose. They pray for one reason. They pray for one subject. They unite and say, Lord, we are asking for this. Jesus promised, and God doesn't lie. 
Jesus gave you his word. He promised when two or three pray in one accord, it will be given to them. So my wife said to me, you said that if two or three get together and pray in one accord, they will get an answer. It's not about power, it's not about numbers, it's not about resources, it's about prayer. Because when you pray, you connect with God, the source of all power. When you eat tofu, Satan is not afraid. When you go to church, Satan is not afraid. You can go to church and be a sinner. When nobody can see you, you still do stupid stuff. When you keep Sabbath, Satan is not afraid. You should keep Sabbath. But you know, lazy people keep every day. They never work. When you know the doctrines, Satan is not afraid. But the spirit of prophecy says that when you pray, Satan and his hosts tremble and run. Because he knows when you pray, you connect with God and then Satan is afraid. So, my wife said to me, you told them it's not about power, it's about praying together in unity, in one accord, in one purpose, one subject, you all unite asking something. You preach that, and yet, why don't you do it? And I said, honey, if I call them to prayer, they are gonna die praying. The lady is 92 years old. She said, that's not for you to decide. Call them to prayer. I said, okay. I don't argue with my wife because I lose when I argue. Next Sabbath, I call them to prayer. And I was really hoping that they say no. I said, would you come tomorrow morning and we pray together so this church would be filled instead of five people we would have a hundred? And I was hoping they say no and leave me alone. And the lady says, yeah. <laughs> See you tomorrow at 4 a.m. I said, what? I cannot sleep anyway, pastor. I said, no, see you tomorrow at 9 a.m. And she said, okay, 5 a.m. I said, no, okay, 8 a.m. She said, okay, 6. I said, no, okay, 7. She said, 6.30, deal. We got it. Next morning, I woke up around 5. It was cold, minus 34, 35, 36, cold. I go to the car, it was ice on my windshield, and I didn't have something to scrap, so I took a credit card and started to clean the ice, and my hands froze, and I was like <laughs> And finally, I cleaned the windshield, I got in the car, cold, <laughs> the car would not start. Finally, I started the car. When I started to breathe in the car, eyes formed inside the car on the windshield. I was trying to clean it and drive and clean it and drive. By the time I got to church, finally the car started to warm up, but then I had to turn it off. And by the time we finished praying, it was cold again. It's not comfortable. To wake up at five and go to church so you pray together is not comfortable. We prayed one day, two days, three days. After a week, I said, okay, we prayed, bye. And the lady said, Pastor, we should pray at least a month. I said, what? See you tomorrow. Okay, we prayed a month. And then I said, finally, they stop. And I said, okay, we stop. And they started. One of them said, Pastor, my kids would never talk to me. Since we started to pray, my kids started to talk to me and ask about church. The other one, Pastor, my husband and I have been separated. Since we pray, we are together. The other one, Pastor, I never had a blessing in my house. Always fighting, always noise. Since we pray, I sense God's presence around my family. Please don't stop. 
What could I say? I said, okay, let's pray another month. After the second month, we had about 60 people instead of 10, 20, 60 people are then in the church. They said, please don't stop. We prayed another month. After three months, we had 120 people attending the church. The conference called me, what program have you implemented? I said, prayer. And they said, prayer and what else? I said, prayer and prayer. <laughs> they said, it's too simple. What do you want me to tell you? That's what we did. Because I told them, with these old ladies, I could not even do evangelism. We just pray together. Jesus gave a promise. Whenever two or three come together and pray in one accord, it will be given to them. Why don't we do it? Why? Why don't we do it? Because when people pray, number one, it takes sacrifice. And we love God, love going to church, but that's one day a week. To pray every day means sacrifice, and we don't like to sacrifice. Number two, because when you pray, Satan attacks you. When you uh, sing in the choir, Satan doesn't attack you. When you go to camp meeting, Satan doesn't attack you. But when you pray, he knows that you are going to change. And he doesn't like you to be connected. He wants you to go to church, but he doesn't want you to be connected with God. When you pray, you connect to God. And Satan is going to attack you. And people call me, Pastor, since I started to pray, a lot of bad stuff happens. Yes. And that's not the reason to stop praying. That's the reason to pray even more. Israel, as long as they were in Egypt, Satan didn't attack them. When they left Egypt, the Egyptian armies came after them. That was not the reason to stop praying or to go back to the previous state, to go to Egypt. That was the reason to pray more. Because every miracle is a response to God's intervention in a crisis. If you want a miracle, you don't know what you pray for. It means that you want a crisis. There is no miracle when there is no crisis. It has to be a crisis, and then you have to pray, so then God intervenes, and then you have a story. When Satan attacks you, that's another reason to pray even more, so God would work. And God allows Satan to attack you, so you pray more, and your faith grows, and your experience with him grows. But God put limits. And so, why don't we get together? Another reason. Because when you pray, not only that Satan attacks you, but the more you connect with God, the more you are transformed, more and more like God. And Satan doesn't want you to change. He wants you to go to church and do what you do. Why don't we pray together? Why don't we do it? Jesus told the disciples, he gave them the Great Commission. How does the Great Commission start? How? Go? No. The Great Commission starts this way. Do not leave. Tear a little longer in the city. Wait a little longer in the city. Don't leave. Wait. Jesus commanded them to wait. And it always says, in the Acts of the Apostles. If you read between page 34 and 52, Ellen White says, the disciples obeyed Jesus' command. It was not a suggestion. It was a command. <clears throat> they obeyed Jesus' command. They didn't leave the city, but they got together and prayed. Do not go. Don't you try to do God's work in your power. Ellen White says, the reason for our failure the reason for our inefficiency, the reason for our lack of success is that we trust too much human wisdom and plans and too little the power of God. Jesus commanded them, don't go. Tear a little longer. Wait a little longer in the city and pray. And pray. And pray. And pray. <clears throat> How long? And pray. Until you receive 
the Holy Spirit. And then Jesus says, when the Holy Spirit comes, you shall receive power. That's what we need. We have a lot of theory, what is good, but we lack power. When the Holy Spirit comes, when God comes, power comes, then go. The reason we don't have success is that we do God's work in our power and strategy and methods and wisdom. And we grow 3%, 3.2%, 3.4%. But the disciples, they knew that they could not do it. I mean, there were 11 people. A few more, maybe 150. Doesn't matter. Jesus told them to evangelize Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the whole world. Remember, they had no money, they had no internet, no cell phone, no Facebook. They had no transportation. They were persecuted by the Pharisees. If I told you to evangelize Bangalore, can you? <coughs> can you? <coughs> can you do it? Every house, every street, every business, every single home. Can you do it? But Jesus didn't tell them to evangelize Jerusalem. He said, go to Judea, go to Samaria, go. So then I tell you, evangelize Bangalore, evangelize the whole India, evangelize the whole continent, evangelize Europe and Africa and Asia and Australia, every city, Frankfurt, Berlin, Sofia, and every city, every house, every street. Can you do it? Can you? Not in human power. The disciples, says in the book of Acts, they knew that they could not do it. And so she says, they humbled themselves and prayed together for power. And they said, Lord, you promised to give us the comforter. You said, it's better if I leave, because if I leave, I'm going to send you the comforter, and he will lead you in all things. Lord, Please, give us the promised power. We are not going to give up. And they prayed and they prayed day and night together. There is power in unity in prayer. When we get together and pray for one subject, God likes that. Unity in prayer. And they prayed together in the upper room. How long? until the Holy Spirit came. And Ellen White says, it was the early rain that helped them to start the work. When the Holy Spirit came, they didn't baptize one, two, three people. They baptized thousands. How many days? The Bible says, and God added to their numbers Daily, they had the Baptist Sunday, a Baptist Monday, a Baptist Tuesday, a Baptist Wednesday, a Baptist Friday, and then Saturday, and then Sunday, and then Monday, and then Tuesday. After three weeks, the deacon says, the water is dirty. And the pastor says, please don't change the water because I have another 3,000 people to baptize. Just put some bleach in it. They had so many people to baptize that they had no time to even take a break. That's a good problem. Why don't you do that? Is it because God is old? God has arthritis. He is old. I'm sorry. I would love to help you, but I, I am sick. Is it because God is sick? Is it because God doesn't love us? Is it because God lost his power? It is because we are not committed to get together and pray for the promised power. Ellen White says, the promised power that came for the disciples belongs to us as much as it belonged to them. And she says, the latter rain, when it comes, the latter rain is going to finish the work with greater power than it started the work. Greater things are going to happen. 
There is no question if the latter rain will come or not. The question is, are you going to be part of it? Because if you don't pray, the latter rain is going to come, but you will not be part of it. I've been traveling a lot. Some countries get together and pray, and they experience revival. Some groups here and there. And, and Ellen White says, don't wait for the whole church because everybody will never come. She says, some groups will come together and some people will not come. She says, don't wait for everybody. You go. For instance, I was in Serbia and I preached in the morning and then I preached in the evening. I told them, I said, I cannot preach too many times because I had three surgeries on my vocal cords and when I speak, they get inflamed and I get pain and I lose my voice. And then I need a few hours break to keep quiet, so I recover. And they said, okay, you don't have to preach. Can you come at four o'clock? I said, why if I don't preach just to hear something? I went there four o'clock. There were hundreds of people giving testimonies beautiful powerful stories we get together we prayed and this is what happened another group we got together we prayed and this is what happened Ellen White says pray plan and work pray plan and work what if we did that so i don't remember all the stories i'm gonna give you one a lady says i was a greek orthodox but I never go to church. I would go to church for Christmas and for Easter. That's it, twice a year. And she says, I was sick, so I prayed, Lord, heal me. And I took a book of prayers. What is that? A book of prayers for her mom. Her mom gave her a book of prayers. And she said, I recited 10 prayers. <laughs> but nothing happened. So I... I so... She said, I googled how to pray, how to pray, teach us how to pray. And you can take a look here and see if I have batteries. So the lady, the Greek Orthodox said, I took a book of prayers that I had from my mom and I prayed and I got no answer. So I googled how to pray. And she said, I found the prayer seminar, Pastor's Goya prayer seminar. And she said, I listened to one. And I listened to two, and then she said, I got hooked. I said, I listened to another one, another one, another one, another sermon, another sermon. And she said, it changed my life. And she said, I started to pray. I would wake up. Thank you. I would wake up. Whoa. She said, I would wake up early in the morning. And she said, I would spend quality time in prayer and study. And she said, it changed my life. And she said, I started to pray for my family. Ellen White says, it is the duty of the parents every morning to pray for their children. She said, as you pray for your children, God comes with his presence in your family and Satan has no access. It's a hedge of protection that he puts around you. It's the duty of the parents. So she said, I started to pray for my family and I started to see God's presence in my family. I started to pray for my friends, for my neighbors. And she said, the more I prayed and the more I studied and the more I listened, the more I was transformed. And she said, I started to read books. I found Pastor Goya's book. I read it. And then she said, I started to read Spirit of Prophecy and I started to listen to more sermons. And the lady says, I own a nails salon manicure and pedicure and she said i go to work and i was doing people's nails and i had headphones listening to sermons and people asked me what music are you listening to and she said it's not music it's a message about powerful prayer and the people says can we listen so she said i took the headphones i put a speaker and i was doing people's nails and people were listening to sermons and then people came next day and i said hey why did you come because you were here yesterday did the nails come off i didn't glue them properly and they said no 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 the nails didn't come off we just want to hear the next sermon so she put chairs in her salon like a theater and people would come not for the nails people would come to listen to sermons and they said i got baptized 
16 other people got baptized, but we didn't stop. This message is so good. We took memory sticks, put sermons on memory sticks, and started to go from home to home in the city. And she says, we don't believe it's powerful. We get together and pray, and then we go from homes to homes, and this is what is happening. If that lady could do it, why we cannot do it? And I could give you story after story after story after story. We have a powerful, wonderful God. And God has made his power available to you. And yet, Satan keeps us sleeping. 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 The, 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 the virgins were waiting for the groom to come. And right when you're supposed to wake up, that's when they fell asleep. Satan wants us to keep sleeping. We have been waiting for Jesus to come. And right now, when the events start happening, and we see the prophecies being fulfilled, and Jesus is coming, right now, we fall asleep. Exactly when we should be awake, and praying, and working. What does it mean that we sleep? It's not that you snore and I snore. Now, Ellen White explains, to sleep means to be so focused on other things that you have no more time to see the events, to understand the urgency of the times we live. And because you don't see the events, because you are distracted with business and this and that, we don't prepare, we don't finish the work, and Jesus comes and we are not ready. We are sleeping. It is time to wake up. It is time to get together and pray. I remember simple examples. I have two cell phones, two cell One is for family, one is for work. I've never in my life lost a cell phone. My wife's, my wife, she loses a telephone every week. One time she dropped the telephone and then rolled with the tractor over the telephone. One time, she forgot the telephone in the refrigerator. I mean, she was talking to our son, and she went to the refrigerator, opened the door, and she wanted to take the food. So she put the telephone in the refrigerator, took the food, closed the door, and then she says to me, I don't know where is my phone. It was in the refrigerator. One time, she loses phones. I never lost one. And I was going to Germany, and on the plane back from Germany, I was tired, I fell asleep, and I lost my phone. It dropped from my pocket on the seat, and there the pilot says, prepare for landing. So the, the flight attendant comes, Mr. Goya, get your chair up. I got my chair up, I put a seatbelt, we landed, I got my stuff, got off the plane, and then I want to call my wife, and I have only one phone, I lost one. So I go back. They didn't allow me to go back on the plane. And I said, I lost my phone. They go there and they look. They said, it's not there. Please go back. They go. They look in the pocket in front of the, uh, the chair in front of me. They look under the chair. They look ahead because maybe when the plane stopped, the phone slided. They look under the chairs in the front, in the back, left, right. They said, we could not find it. So they started a case. They sent me an email. We are going to look for a month. After a month, they emailed me and they said, we are going to close the case because we could not find your telephone. And then I go to Australia. And I fly five hours to Los Angeles, two hours in Los Angeles, 16 hours to Sydney. I have only one hour in Sydney because my plane came late. Instead of having two hours, I have only one hour, and I have to change from the international airport to the domestic airport. And the flight attendant says, Mr. Goya, go, go, go. There is a shuttle every 15 minutes. Catch the shuttle so you catch the plane in the other airport. So I was talking to the lady, and I put my other cell phone, my work cell phone, on the counter. I talked to her, and she says, look, the bus is there. Run, run. And I forgot my second phone. And I run to the bus. When I am on the bus, I want to call my wife. And I don't have any cell phone. I lost my second phone. And I start praying. I say, Lord, 
I never ask you anything for myself. I always pray for God's work, pray for God's people, I pray for others. But now I need a telephone. I cannot call my work, I cannot get an email, I cannot call my wife, I cannot connect with my work. Please, you know what, you can see it, you are God. You see what is my cell phone, please give me my cell phone back. I am praying and the bus driver, is Mr. Goya in the bus? I said, I'm right behind you. He says, the cashier says that you forgot, the, the lady says that you forgot your telephone on the counter. And she says, don't come back because you have to wait 15 minutes for the next shuttle, and then 15 minutes to here, and then 15 minutes for the next shuttle, and then 15 minutes to there, you lose the plane. Just wait there, and the next shut shuttle in 15 minutes brings your phone. I said, praise the Lord. So I am waiting in the domestic airport for the next shuttle to come with my telephone. And I am praying, I said, Lord, you are a wonderful God. You answered and gave me my work phone. Would you mind to please give me my family phone too? <laughs> I know that it has been already almost two months. I know that they are no longer looking for my telephone because they closed the case. But you are God. Mm. Nothing is impossible for you. Would you please give me my family phone? The bus comes, he gives me my phone, and then I have an email from Delta. They said, the plane stopped in Sun Lake City because it was defective. A chair would not recline. So they opened the chair and they found your cell phone there that would stop the chair to recline. So they said, we mail your cell phone to your home. When you get home, you are going to find it home. We have a wonderful God, don't we? We have a wonderful God. And yet, we don't get together and pray. We just want blessings, we want benefits, we want help. And we go to God, help me, bless me, give me my phone, fix my truck, give me, my, give me a house, help my family. Me, 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 me. We don't get together and pray that God would use us to actually help others. And Jesus didn't come to die for our comfort. He came to die to save the lost. God calls you to get together and pray. In Germany, the youth told me, they said, you would imagine that this is Germany and is not Africa. You don't go to people and call them to evangelists. But they said, we, a group of young people in South Germany, they said, we got together. And we prayed, and then we planned, and then we worked. So we said, let's go on the street and pray with people. And they said, you would imagine that people in Germany would refuse prayer. And they said, you don't know. People are so stressed with the wars, so stressed with the COVID, so stressed with the economy, so stressed with this and that. We offer people prayer. Over 70% said, please pray for me. And then we gave them books. And when I preached there, there were hundreds of people attending the meetings. If that happened in Germany, if that happened in Serbia, it can happen here too. If that happens in Tanzania, they baptized over 300,000, I don't remember the number, over 300,000 people last year. 300,000 people. That division got close to 2 million members. There are stories there. If that happens there, it can happen here. I could give you a lot of stories from around the world. Very interesting. The disciples got together in the upper room and prayed. But remember, the disciples thought that Jesus would come as a king to deliver them from Romans. Am I right? And they said, we thought on the road to, the, to, on the road to Emmaus, the two people, and Jesus joins them. And Jesus says, what are you talking about? And they said, are you a stranger? Don't you know what happened in Jerusalem? And Jesus says, tell me. And the two disciples on the road to Emmaus, they say, we thought that he would deliver us from the Romans, but he died. The disciples were greatly disappointed 
because they thought that Jesus came to deliver them and make them a powerful kingdom. And Jesus died because he came with another purpose. But the pioneers of our church in 1844, they thought that Jesus would physically come in October 1844. Am I right? And Jesus didn't come and they were disappointed too. The disciples got disappointed. The pioneers got disappointed. The disciples got in the upper room and prayed. The pioneers, the, the history says that they got together in a room and prayed. The disciples received the Holy Spirit and they understood the cross. The pioneers received the Holy Spirit and they understood the sanctuary. Am I right? The disciples, when they got the Holy Spirit, they preached with power and thousands got baptized. The pioneers, when the Holy Spirit came, they understood the sanctuary and they understood the prophecy. When the Bible says that the book was sweet in the mouth but bitter in the tummy, the next verse says, go and preach to all the nations. So it was not the end of the world. They had the work to do. They had the work to do. They had to go to every nation, preach to everyone. They understood that they have to preach. When they received the Holy Spirit, they went preaching and the church started with the hand of people and multiplied to 20, almost 23 million people right now. If, the, if those pioneers would be alive to see that from a hand of people, it's, it, it's a church that is in the entire world, in every, almost every country. I've been there. I've been in Maine. If you go in Maine, you see that old church with old books, old stove, and you see the tools in the kitchen, and you see the pictures with Ellen White and William Miller and Josiah Leach and all those people. They were waiting for Jesus to come. And in that night, they went to that rock. I've been there. It's a rock that is flat, and then is the hill, and then up, and then the mountain. They went to that rock, and they waited, and it was 12 o'clock, 1 a.m., 2 a.m., 5 a.m., 6 a.m., and Jesus didn't come. And almost 500,000 people, half million, left the church disappointed, and left over was a hand of people that they were just disparate. What happened? Jesus didn't come. The Bible cannot be wrong. It means that we are wrong. Those disappointed disciples and those disappointed pioneers, they both prayed together. And when they prayed, God helped them understand. And when they prayed, the Holy Spirit came. And when they prayed, they received power. And when they prayed, they preached the disciple to the whole world. Ellen White says that they preached in a few years and did so much work that without the Holy Spirit, they could not have done in their life. They quote, it says in the book of Acts, they turned the world upside down, a group of disciples. Because God doesn't need numbers. God needs quality, dedication, prayer. The pioneers, a group of people, most of them left disappointed. A group of people prayed together, received the Holy Spirit. They preached and the gospel went in the whole world. What stops us? Moreover, in the time that we live to get together and pray for the Holy Spirit so we could finish the work. Why don't we do it? If you fast forward, as long as they prayed, the church grew faster and faster and faster and faster, covering more and more and more countries. And then they got busy with business and stopped praying and the church stopped growing. Because prayer takes time. When Abraham prayed for a child, how long did it take until he got a child? 25 years. When Moses prayed, how long it took in the wilderness until God used him? 40 years. When Noah prayed, how long did it take? 120 years. And people call me, Pastor, we have been praying for a week and nothing happened. And I tell them, me too. I was going to school for a week and they didn't give me a degree. <laughs> How could you expect? You pray for a week and change happens. God doesn't work with wood. God works with people. People are stubborn. 
God has to prepare people, has to prepare the church, has to prepare the city. God has to work with people. So you need to keep praying so God keeps working. If you stop praying, God stops working. When Daniel prayed, it took three weeks. And then the angel Gabriel comes and says, when you started, not when you finished, when you started to pray, I started to work. But it took you three weeks to pray because I had to fight the kings of Medes and Persians. And just now I have an answer. Imagine, Daniel didn't see that war. So Daniel just kept praying. What if Daniel would have stopped praying? What happened? In 1856, what year? 1856, Ellen White talks to the leaders of the church and says, Jesus could come, but we are not ready because we don't get together to pray for the Holy Spirit. Let's pray for the Holy Spirit. Let's pray together for revival. We need revival. And as she started to preach to them, she says there were groups of people here and there getting together and starting to pray. And then she says more, and then more, and this group would experience revival, and that group would experience revival, and that group would experience revival, and the others would see, and then more people would join, and more people would form groups, and more people, and she says it started to, to grab the whole church. Now listen carefully. When they started to pray, in what year? 1856, November 1856, they prayed until a end of April, beginning of May 1857. How many months? November, December, January, February, March, April. How many months? Six months they prayed. When they prayed for six months, what happened? Very interesting, very interesting. What happened? When they prayed for six months, I don't know if you, if, you, if you know about Jeremiah Lampierre. Jeremiah Lampierre, if I connect to the internet, to the, I can show you the picture. In New York, if you go to New York, in front of the Central Park, it's a building called the Bible Society Building. In front of that building, it's a bench that is made of copper, and on the bench is a statue made of copper. And then it's a plaque that says Jeremiah Lampierre. This man called New York to prayer. He said, New York City should come and pray together for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit for revival. This man was not a pastor. He was a businessman. He called people to prayer. He said, 12 o'clock at noon during lunch, come in the Central Park. Let's pray together for revival. You know how many people came? Nobody? Who knows? Ten people. He was disappointed. Oh, I expected 300 and only 10 people come. But they prayed. Our members were praying. This group was praying. A week later, it was six months, and then this guy started to pray. A week later, the economy dropped. The economy collapsed. Because sometimes God, the Spirit of Prophecy says that God allows some things to happen, to wake up his people so they prepare. To wake them up so they prepare. So the economy collapsed. When the economy collapsed, next day, you know how many came to prayer? Around 100,000. Because when people are afraid, people go to prayer. When people are afraid of COVID, people go to prayer. When people are afraid of, you know, 9-11 or this or that, people go to prayer. 100,000 people came to prayer, and then next week 300,000, and next week half million. And then it says, every week there were over 10,000 conversions, over 10,000 baptisms a week. In one year and a half, there were 1.4 million people converted. And then the revival didn't happen only in New York. It moved, listen what it says, it moved from New York to South America, and then it moved, very interesting, uh, to Chile, Brazil, and then it moved to North Canada, and then it moved to Europe, and then to Central Europe, and then to Southern Europe, and then to Africa, and then to India, and then to Australia, and then he says, it impacted the whole world. And the Lenoir says, Satan was not happy. 
revival was happening. So Satan came with a plan. Satan with his evil angels came, they had a meeting probably, and they said, what shall we do? People are waking up, people are preparing, what shall we do? And Satan came with a plan. In that time, they found gold in America, and people went to California to get gold. And they also, the government announced, we are going to give free land to people who start a farm. So the government offered free land if you would start a farm. So she says, our people stopped praying to get farms. Our people stopped praying to get land. And then she says, we are not worthy and we are not ready for the full outpouring of the Holy Spirit because we had other priorities. And the revival stopped. And she says, Jesus would have come then, but you would have had to pray and work a little longer until the gospel would have gone to the whole world. Basically, they had to keep praying so the gospel had time to go to every, from city to city, to go to every country in the world. And Jesus, she says, would have come then. But revival stopped because we stopped praying. And then in 1901, in 1901, she had a vision and she told the leaders, we need to get together and pray for the power of the Holy Spirit. And they did. They started to pray and then the unions and then the conferences and then the members, groups, groups, more groups, more groups, they started to pray. In what year? 1901. They started to pray. You know how long they prayed? 1903. How many years? Two years. When they started to pray, listen what happened. Very interesting. Oh, by the way, I forgot to tell you, when Jeremiah Lampierre was praying in New York and they had revival in the same time, in the same time in England, Keswick, Keswick Convention, they started to pray hundreds of thousands got converted. In the same time in Chicago, Moody had revival in the same time everywhere. She says in Great Controversy, page 458, if all would have continued to pray, Christ would have come. Christ would have come. Christ would have come. In 1901, they started to pray. They prayed for two years. After two years, in England, it's a guy, his name is Evan Roberts. It's called the Welsh Revival. The guy goes to church. He's in the front. Next to him is a girl. And the pastor says, and Jesus died for you. And the pastor, when he did that, died for you, put his hand towards him. And he looks left and right, he says, for me? And the girl next to him says, yeah, for you. He says, Jesus, God, died for me? And he collapsed on his knees in front of the chair. And he said, if God died for me, why don't we get together? ready to sacrifice anything for him. Why don't we get together and pray and work to finish the work? And he said, tonight, nobody goes home. Let's stay here and pray together. And they prayed from seven to 11. And then they said, let's go home, sleep. Tomorrow night again. Tomorrow night, they came back and they prayed from seven to 11. Next night again, after a week, they said, let's pray from seven to midnight. After a week, they said, let's pray from seven to morning. Let's pray the whole night. And people would come and go because some of them had to go to work. Somebody would come, stay one hour, leave. Somebody else would come. And they would pray the whole night for revival. After two, three months, it started to spread to the whole city, to the whole county, to the whole Welsh area, to the degree that the whole county, all the cities, all the villages got baptized. They all got converted. So a journalist goes to the courthouse to take notes of some process in the court. And the courthouse is closed. And he's asking people, where is the judge? Where are the lawyers? Why is the court closed? And he's told, because everybody in the city got converted, 
so there is no more crimes. So judge and lawyers got fired. So he goes to the police to see what happened to that case. When he goes to the police, the history says that the police, all of them, were singing. So he asked the chief of the police, what are you doing? And he says, well, the whole city got converted, no more crimes, so we don't know what to do. So what we did, we formed a choir and go from church to church and sing. The police was singing because the whole city got converted. And the history says that horses would not listen to people that, you know, those diligences, those things that carry people in the back. The people who would run the horses used to curse. When they would start the horses, they cursed. And now nobody cursed because people got baptized. So the history says that horses would not listen because they were used to curses and now nobody would curse. The transformation was so major that the whole area got converted. And it didn't happen only in England. It moved from England, from Wales, to the whole country, to the whole Central Europe, to Scandinavia, to Southern Europe, then went from US to Canada, to Southern uh, America. It went then to uh, Brazil, to Chile, to Mexico. It went then to Australia, to New Zealand, a year later to Korea, three years later to China. And then it says, when they started to pray, in first testimony, seven says, when they started to pray, God, listen carefully, God sent angels in the whole world to prepare the world for the second coming, to prepare the world to receive the truth. But she says, they got tired because they didn't see quick results. They got tired because they didn't see, we pray and then we want the result. And if we don't see results, we stop. And she says, if they would have kept praying, God would have kept working and the revival would have caught the whole world and Jesus would have come. But Satan knew that if they pray, the work would be finished, the Holy Spirit would come, the latter rain would come with extreme power. When the latter rain comes, power happens, miracles happen, thousands get baptized, sick get healed. It is extreme, above any imagination. When the Holy Spirit comes, power comes. But our people stopped praying. God is calling you. Don't look to self. That's what Israel did. In the wilderness, they looked to the giants. Oh, in Jericho there are giants. They have big walls. They have big army. We cannot do it. And the Bible says, in Hebrew chapter 3. They didn't enter the promised land because of, not because of the giants, not because of their sinfulness, not because of the armies, because of their unbelief. They didn't trust their God. The two spies that were good, which are those, Joshua and Caleb, they said, Remember how God has led you in the past. Remember how he got you out of Egypt. Remember how he split the Red Sea. Remember how he gave you victories. Remember how he gave you manna. Remember how he gave you water from the rock. Trust in your Lord. Go forward in faith. God will not fail. Ellen White says, we have nothing to fear unless we forget how God has led us in the past history. They looked to problems instead of looking to God. When we fail, it's because we look to ourselves, we look to resources, we look to our problems. Man, I have a job. If we pray too long, how am I going to survive? Because we look to self instead of looking to God. What if we got together and prayed? Can you imagine what would happen? I remember specifically in one church. Oh, brother, that was a countryside church, very small, 
20, 30, 40 members in a good Sabbath, big program, Christmas program, 40 members. There is more, very conservative, very old, in an old building, old, 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 old building, no money, no youth. There was no hope. And so I told them, get together and pray. And they said, Pastor, we come to church every Sabbath, we return tithe, we sing, we love Jesus, but we don't have time to pray, Pastor. One lady, one, one lady got every morning up around five o'clock and she prayed, Lord, you said two or three, but I don't have anybody. Only me and my husband. What did she say? I don't have anybody, only? How many were there? Two! Didn't Jesus say two or three? He says, Lord, it's only me and my husband. We don't have money. We don't have power. We don't have influence. We don't know what to do. But you told us that if we pray together, you'll answer. Tell us what to do to revive our dying church. And she came to me, Pastor, we've been praying for two weeks and nothing happened. I said, listen, Ellen White says in Steps to Christ, prayer is the breath of the soul. Prayer is the breath of the soul. Now let me ask you, I said, how many times do you breathe a day? Five minutes? Ten minutes? How long do you breathe? How long do you breathe? All the time! If you stop breathing, you die. And she says, when you stop praying, you decline spiritually and die. The Bible says, pray without ceasing. I said, keep praying. Prayer is not an event. Prayer is a lifestyle like breathing. You need to pray as long as you live so you stay connected. That doesn't mean that you go, don't go to work. That doesn't mean that you stay in the room 24-7 like this. That means that wherever you go, work, wherever you go, you keep connected. Satan has no more access to you or your family. God starts transforming you, preparing you, and using you. Keep praying. She says, how long? I said, until you receive power. I said, okay. I thought that she would stop praying, but she didn't. She kept praying. After about three months, she called me, she says, Pastor, I'm a third generation Adventist. I keep Sabbath, I go to church, I am faithful. But I have never experienced God's presence until now. Now, I sense God's presence in my life, in my family. I started to know God's voice. You know, Jesus says, my sheep know my voice. If you don't know his voice, he says, my sheep. That means that you are not his sheep, you know. The Bible says, he who has ears to hear what the Holy Spirit says. So she says, Pastor, I've been an Adventist all my life. I'm a third generation Adventist. Yet, until now, I never sense God's voice. Now I sense when God inspires me to do something. And it's amazing. I experience him every few days. Something happens. I have stories. Until now, I didn't have stories. I just go to church and homes. Now I have stories. I listen to God and then things happen. And she says, Pastor, I sense God's presence. The Spirit of Prophecy says, those who are continually connected would sense unseen powers around them. They would sense the presence of God. They would sense the presence of angels. She says they would sense unseen powers around them, leading them. She said, I started to experience that. And she says, God inspired me what to do for the church. She said, this church is in a little town. The whole town is poor. The church is poor. If we preach them to come to evangelism, they don't come. But if we give them food, if we feed them, then they will listen. And she said, God inspired me to start a community center for the poor. 
I said in my mind, da yeah, 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 yeah. God inspired you. Why didn't he inspire me? I am the pastor. But I didn't say. But in my mind, I said, I said, what? A community center? You know what that means? You need a building. You need money. You need people to work there. You need food. You need clothing. You need stuff to give to people. Do you have that? I said, pastor, didn't you say that when the Holy Spirit comes, power comes, and that we should not look to problems. We should look to God. Because God owns the cattle on 10,000 hills. Didn't you say that, Pastor, in the sermon? I said, yeah, 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 but you should not listen to the sermons. <laughs> she said, my God has the resources. If we pray, you said that he will work above our power. And she said, we need to start a community center. So she talked to the church board. The church board didn't listen to her. They said, community center, we don't have the money, we don't have the building, we don't have the staff, we don't have the people, go away. She came to me, pastor, you told me to pray, now you need to go with me. I said, why in the world I told her to pray, now I have to go with her? She says, Thursday morning. I said, okay, Thursday morning, nine o'clock. Thursday morning, 9 o'clock, I go there and we start. We go in town from house to house, from house to house, from door to door, from door to door. We need a building. Do you have a building to rent? We didn't find anything. What we found was very expensive. After about one month, we finished the town. Every Thursday, every Thursday. I got tired from 9 to 12, knocking from door to door every Thursday. After about a month, I said, enough, leave me alone. She said, Pastor, you told us not to give up. That the disciples prayed, that the pioneers should have prayed longer. You told us not to give up because as long as we pray and work, God works. And we need to continue until he can prepare everything. You told us like the judge and the woman. The woman goes to the judge again and again and again until she gets justice. You told us not to give up. Okay, see you next Sunday. We finish that little town. She says, let's go to the next town. We went to the next town a whole month and a half from door to door every Thursday from 9 to 12. I got tired. We finished the next town. She says, let's go back to the first town again. I was ready to move from that district. I didn't even want to see her anymore. I was tired. We started, we went back to the first town door to door second time and then we finished and then we went back to the second town door to door six months every Thursday. I hate it to go. After six months, I finally prayed. I said, Lord, please give us a building so I don't have to go every Thursday with this lady. Please. I remember one Thursday, we were knocking a door and my telephone rings. No, no, we found, sorry, we found a building and he had a little business. And he says, this is the third time when you come to my door. We said, yes, because we didn't find the building. He says, I asked you for 4,000 a month, but nobody gave me 4,000 a month. How much can you pay? And she says, 2,000 a month. He says, okay, you can have the building for 2,000 a month. I said, hallelujah, praise the Lord. Next Thursday, I am not coming. We signed the contract and then my telephone starts ringing and says, I am the general manager from Kmart store. Are you Pastor Goya? Yes. Do you have a building? I said, how do you know? He says, everybody knows. You knocked in every door. Did you find the building? Yes. Do you have shelving? No. We close the store. Come here. I want to help. I'm going to give you shelving for free. We were there. God gave us the building. God gave us shelving. We were putting the shelving in the store, and I got a call. He says, I'm the Lutheran pastor. You have the building. I said, how do you know? He says, everybody knows. If you ask them before, what is the Adventist church? Nobody knew. It was a little old building with a little group of people. 
But God allowed us for six months from door to door so the whole city and the next city would know because God wanted them to be part of it. And they didn't understand that all things work together for a purpose. And then the Lutheran pastor said, I'm going to give you furniture and clothing. And then the Baptist pastor, six different denominations, Lutheran, Baptist, Presbyterian, six different denominations called and they gave donations. When Katrina Hurricane came, this little church sent for a month several trucks a week with help from this store. The government called, Pastor Guia, yes, you do such a good job there, would like to give you the food stamps for the poor so your community center would distribute them to the poor. The jail called, Pastor Goya, yes, when people come out of jail, they have six months probation and they need to do community work. We want them to work in your store to learn to serve the community. And then we got on the newspaper on the front page, the Adventist church is helping our community. The Adventist church is helping the poor. The Adventist church. And then people started to come, not for stuff, not the poor, but everybody would come. We came here because you make a difference in our community. You care. Would you pray for us? So I started to pray with them. And then the Presbyterian pastor called me angry. I have prayer meeting every Tuesday and they don't come to me because they come to your prayer meeting on Tuesday. He said, okay, I'm going to move it on Wednesday. He says, they still don't come. I said, what do you want me to do? He says, do your prayer meeting on Wednesday and come to my prayer meeting on Tuesday because if you come, people come. So I had to do prayer meeting at the community center on Wednesday and prayer meeting in the Presbyterian church on Tuesday. The whole city started to know. People started to come. This little church, 40 members, started to have visitors because one lady with her husband prayed for three months. What if every family or the church would be divided in groups and they would come together and they all prayed? Can you imagine what God can do? We limit God because we are comfortable. I want to be kind. I'm not going to say lazy. I'm going to say comfortable. Why don't we get together and pray for the Holy Spirit? Why don't we pray for the outpouring of the latter rain? Why? Is it because God cannot work or because Satan wants to keep us sleeping? It is time to wake up. It is time to do what Jesus commanded us to do. Do not go, but wait a little longer in the city and pray. Pray for the promised comforter. If you who are evil get good gifts to your children, how much more your Father in heaven will give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? She says, and then I says, we don't receive because we don't ask. But then she says, the Holy Spirit doesn't come in vain. The Holy Spirit doesn't come just, please give me the Holy Spirit. She says, the Holy Spirit comes to enable us for mission. And she says, if you pray but you are not willing to go to mission, you will not receive the Holy Spirit. You say, Lord, give me the Holy Spirit because I want to reach my children. Lord, give me the Holy Spirit because I want to reach my neighbors or my city. And I cannot do it. But I need you. When you pray for a purpose because you want to serve, God answers. God is calling you not to be only listeners, but to be doers. Amen? Yeah, amen. It's getting me. If not today, then when? If you procrastinate and you don't have time today, do you think you are going to have time tomorrow? Oh no, Satan is going to keep you busy tomorrow too. You'll never do it. God is calling you to act on it. Jesus is coming. Prophecies are fulfilled. The Holy Spirit, the latter rain, will come. Are you going to be part of it? Or you will be out? And say, please open the door. And Jesus says, you never had time for me. You don't know me, I don't know you. Then, why do you go to church? If you go to church a whole life, and you will not be in heaven, what's the purpose? So, Trying to finish because our time is up. 
Oh yes, our time is up. We do need to finish. <clears throat> the last message, last day events, page 200. The last message to be given to the world is the revelation of Christ's character, of love, his grace. The children of God are to manifest his love and glory in their own life. This message, Christ's love, Christ's character, this message, if it's proclaimed in the power of the Spirit, is going to lighten the earth and the end will come. Christ's righteousness is the third angel's message. It is to be sound, proclaimed from one end to the other end of the world to prepare the way for the Lord. This message, if preached, will be attended by the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in large measure and the end will come. This message, if we preach it in the power of the Spirit, is going to illuminate the whole world. There will be revivals everywhere. There will be powerful things happening. Thousands will be baptized. And Jesus is going to come. The gospel is going to be preached everywhere. This message is going to be preached. God is calling you to be part of it. How many of you says that the Holy Spirit is calling them to act. If the Holy Spirit talks to you, would you say, I'm willing to be part of it? Lord, here I am. I want to pray. I want to work. I want to go. I'm going to let you use me. God has a plan. You may not be able to do it, but God is able. Don't look to problems. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Because if you complain that there are problems, it's because you don't know your God. If you know your God, you know nothing is impossible for God. All things are possible. God can do above and beyond what you pray or imagine. God can do things that will blow your mind. Amen? Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And do not lean in your own understanding. How many of you say, Lord, I'm willing to pray and I'm going to trust in you and do whatever you say? How many of you want to do that? Amen.